Welcome to this video and this is going to be a crash course in DC motors. I'm going to start with the basic principles underpinning the operation of all DC motors. It's really easy. I'll also talk about the three basic requirements to build a DC motor and then I'll discuss the different types of DC motor, their different behavior and importantly how they can be controlled. So I'll start off with the basics right from the Lorentz force which explains why motors operate the way they do. I'll then introduce the permanent magnet DC motor, it's the easiest one to start with and I'll use this to explain some of the fundamental principles of DC motor operation. Lots of this is also applicable to the wound DC motors which come a bit later. Then I'll tackle the important topic of DC motor control, so how you can regulate torque and speed. And then I'll finish with the wound DC motors. All DC motors rely on the so-called Lorentz force. In simple terms, if a charge moves in the presence of a magnetic field, the charge will experience a force. The magnitude of this force will depend on the velocity and direction of the charge in relation to the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field. The left hand rule gives us a shortcut way to know what force we can expect for a given arrangement of charge and field. Now obviously the force on each individual charge in a conductor is tiny, but there are so many of them that they add up to something quite substantial and this is enough to make a conductor move. In practical terms it means we can make a conductor move if we can find some way to pass a current through a conductor in the presence of a sideways magnetic field. This in essence is how all DC motors work and when we start talking about different types of DC motor it's important to remember that there are only three basic requirements. First, we need a current carrying conductor. Second, we need a magnetic field. And third, we need to solve the engineering problem of allowing the conductor to spin without becoming tangled. Now in this video, we'll address these four DC motor configurations. And again, just remember that each one has a slightly different way of solving the three basic requirements. That's why there are different types. Now the first one we'll discuss is the permanent magnet DC motor with its use of permanent magnets to generate the field. Then we have the wound DC motors, which use a winding to generate a field. The first of these is called the separately excited DC motor with two separate circuits, one for the field and one for the armature. The shunt DC motor has the field and the armature in parallel, so you require just a single source. And then finally we have the series motor, which places the field and the armature in series, and that does bring about some interesting behavior, and we'll discuss these later. So let's start with the permanent magnet DC motor. I'm actually gonna spend a bit longer on this one because I'll cover some of the fundamentals of DC motor design and control, which are also applicable to the wound DC motors. So I would recommend you don't skip ahead because you might miss something important. Now, the equivalent circuit of the permanent magnet DC motor shows the armature circuit comprising the armature resistance and this symbol called M. This represents the back EMF produced by the motor as it spins and it always opposes the supply voltage. We'll come on to the significance of this a bit later. Now the pink arrows here show the magnetic field which of course is derived in this case from permanent magnets. This gives us a constant magnetic field. When we move on to the wound DC motors this is represented by its own circuit and it uses a winding to produce a magnetic field. Let's show a primitive design for our DC motor. We start by showing the magnetic field lines emanating from the permanent magnets. Within this region, we can place our armature, here shown by a simple rectangular conductor. Let's suppose for now that we can generate a DC current in the armature. Due to the Lorentz force, the moving charges within the conductor will start to experience a force. This force will depend, of course, on the relative directions of the field and the direction of the current. Here we see that the armature will move anti-clockwise. But we notice that the motor doesn't spin. It kind of just locks into the 12 o'clock position. Now, why does it do this? Well, the problem with our primitive design is the fact that the direction of the force points up at the top and down at the bottom. So it locks in the vertical position. This is something we can work out based on the left-hand rule. Now, what we need to do to resolve this problem is reverse the direction of the current when it reaches the vertical position. This will of course reverse the direction of the force according to the Lorentz force and the left hand rule. 
if we assume that the motor has enough momentum to take it past the vertical position, the reversal of the force will allow the armature to continuously spin. Now, here we meet our first engineering problem. How do we reverse the direction of the current every half cycle? Well, the answer is the commutator. Now, a simple but incredibly effective part of the brushed DC motor is called the commutator. The commutator simultaneously solves the problem of reversing the current polarity every half cycle and prevents the supply to the armature becoming tangled. Let's have a closer look at how the commutator is designed. We start with a pair of conducting split rings. Each half ring is connected to one arm of the armature. Now the electrical connection, and here's the clever bit, is connected through a pair of brushes. And these brushes provide an electrical connection whilst simultaneously allowing the commutator to spin. Now because the commutator is split, the polarity of the voltage supplying the armature reverses every half cycle. This satisfies the requirement of reversing the current direction at the vertical position and allows the armature to spin freely. Now in practice, a single plane of commutation doesn't provide a smooth torque. So it's common to subdivide the commutator into additional planes of commutation. This ensures that at least one part of the armature is at a maximum torque position and it smooths out the rotational torque. Here's a cutaway of a real DC machine and you can see the way that the commutator is split into many sections. This does of course complicate the design of the machine so in this video I'll be sticking to a single plane of commutation but just be aware that practical DC motors have lots of planes of commutation. Now let's incorporate the commutator into our primitive design. All we need to do now is supply our motor with a DC source. We can see that with the commutator the current is now reversing direction every half cycle. In principle DC motors are extremely simple to build as long as you can satisfy the three requirements we talked about earlier. One, we need a current carrying conductor, the armature. Two, we need a magnetic field. And three, we need to allow the armature to spin freely within the magnetic field without becoming tangled and of course with commutation. Now we've covered the basic design of a brushed DC motor. Now we might be interested in building a model that can help us predict how it might perform. Well before we do that there's one very important phenomena that we need to address. It's called back EMF. As the motor spins, it will generate its own electromotive force. This is exactly what Faraday's law, or more specifically Lenz's law, would predict because essentially we have a conductor which is moving in a magnetic field. The EMF generated will depend on a few factors. First, it will depend on how fast the armature is spinning. If it spins faster, the rate of change of magnetic flux is greater, which means the induced voltage is also greater. It also depends on the construction of the machine. In other words, how good is the machine at converting magnetic field into voltage? This factor is represented by the constant K. Phi is the field and omega is the rotational speed. So here we have a simple expression for back EMF. And of course, this is what the symbol M represents. So M is actually a voltage source, which depends on the speed of the motor. And this actually gives rise to the most important equation in the analysis of DC motors. This is the voltage balance equation. The voltage balance equation tells us that the supply voltage E, some places call this V by the way, is equal to the back EMF plus the voltage drop across the armature. This gives us a simple and powerful way to analyze and predict the behavior of DC motors. Now we note that the back EMF is a function of the speed of the motor, so it will actually change with the speed. The armature current depends on the torque. So the question arises, how do we know the balance between EMF and armature voltage drop? Well, we have equations which show that the back EMF is proportionate to speed and the current is proportionate to the torque at that operating condition. And for a particular supply voltage, a DC motor has a special characteristic telling you which speed you can expect for a particular torque. This will give you a set of operating points which, at steady state, the motor will follow. Remember, the steady state condition will be reached when the electrical torque developed is equal to the mechanical torque of the load. 
Now looking at this curve, we note that the speed drops as the torque increases. This means for higher torques, meaning higher armature currents, the motor spins slower. This kind of makes sense because as the torque increases, the current must increase too. And this means more power is being wasted in the armature. But it isn't all bad news. The sort of natural regulation curve of a DC motor is actually pretty good. So you get a nice constant speed over a wide range of torques. And I'll explain why this is the case a bit later. But first, let's look at the mechanism by which the motor transitions along its characteristic curve. Let's start at no load. This means there's no torque, so the armature current must be zero. Next, let's assume the load increases. This means the mechanical torque exceeds the electrical torque at that moment. The motor will slow down, and if the motor slows down, the back EMF, which of course is proportionate to speed, will drop. And if the back EMF drops, the armature current will increase, and this will increase the torque until we reach a new steady state at a different point on the speed torque graph. So we've gone from operating point one at no load to operating point two with a higher torque and a lower speed. Now it's quite common to want to regulate the speed or the torque to a constant level or be able to adjust it beyond the kind of movements we make on the natural speed torque graph. Here we show how increasing the supply voltage shifts the curve upwards or downwards and this gives us a way to regulate the speed and torque. We'll go into detail on how this works a bit later. Now, I've already mentioned that if the DC motor has a constant flux, it has inherently good speed regulation over a wide range of torque. To explain why, take a look at this simulation. We start off at no load and then I increase the torque. The armature current and volt drop increases, but the increase is small relative to the size of the back EMF. In other words, the armature current increase has a relatively small effect on the back EMF. Yes, it decreases, but only by a small amount. This is a great feature of the DC motor because we have this very nice regulation of speed over a wide range of torques. A motor will always try to reach a steady state operating point at which the mechanical torque is just equal to the electrical torque and it will have a natural speed at this operating point determined by its speed torque graph. We've already seen that the drop off in speed as torque increases is relatively small and this is because the armature volt drop is relatively small in comparison to the back EMF. So the motor can maintain a high speed even if the torque goes up. But in many applications, we might want to change the speed and torque beyond what's possible on this speed torque graph. The easiest way to do this in a DC motor is called armature voltage control. As we saw previously, the speed torque characteristic represents a set of operating points for a particular supply voltage. But if we change the supply voltage, this curve shifts and we can exploit this to adjust the speed or torque to suit our requirements. For a fixed armature supply voltage, an increase in torque will mean we slide down the regulation curve to a new steady state. But we always have the option of modifying the voltage to take us somewhere different. Take a look at this example. We start off by slowly increasing the supply voltage to increase the speed. See how we shift upwards to different speed torque graphs. If we reach a steady voltage and then the torque suddenly increases, we slide down the particular curve that we're on so the speed drops. But we can compensate for this by increasing the voltage again to bring us back to the target speed. This kind of adjustment of armature voltage is known as armature voltage control. It means we can make adjustments to the supply voltage to regulate either speed or torque to a constant level. Note that here, since we want a constant speed, the torque is allowed to vary. If we want a constant torque, we need to allow the speed to vary. Now, armature voltage control is an excellent strategy for controlling the DC motor, but it only works until you reach the rated voltage of the DC motor. At that point, we're forced to use a different method of speed control known as flux weakening, and we'll discuss that later. 
but back on the topic of armature voltage control, you begin to realize that the trick to using this method is controlling the supply voltage in a way that meets your requirements. Now, quite often you'll hear about torque control using a resistor in series with the armature. This provides a continuously adjustable method of varying the supply voltage to the armature. If you think about it, you create a voltage divider with the armature, and this gives you an adjustable armature voltage based on the value of the variable resistor. Now, if you make the variable resistor larger, you get larger voltage drops for a given amount of current. So you end up with a steeper speed torque graph. As you can see here, it's just a matter of selecting the variable resistance, which gives you the speed or torque that you require. Now, say you start off at R1, decreasing the resistance will give you a higher torque at the same speed. So the armature current increases. But what you're really doing here is actually the same as armature voltage control. It just so happens to be the case that decreasing the variable resistor leads to a higher voltage at the terminals of the armature. So what we actually have with armature resistance control is an extremely inefficient way to regulate the voltage across the armature because the portion of the supply voltage that you don't want is burnt away in the variable resistor, giving higher losses and a worse regulation. But I think we're on the right track. We just need a more efficient way to control the voltage at the armature. Now, the way this problem was solved is with an electronic switch, transistor, thyristor, etc. Now, this can act as a chopper circuit, and this chops up the input voltage into pulses. The average value of this new voltage is dependent on the duty cycle of the pulses. What's more, this method can be easily controlled by turning the electronic switch on and off at the right time. And this is achievable using simple electronics. A huge advantage of this method is that it's much more efficient than using a resistor. Granted, the voltage waveform is now a train of pulses, but the current is actually much smoother because it's filtered by the inductance of the armature. So the torque is much smoother than you might think. And the efficiency of this method is much closer to 100%. Now we discussed torque and speed control, and we might be interested in designing an automatic way to regulate these things. One way we can do this is by measuring the current going into the armature. This of course is proportionate to torque and then feed this to a control system which compares the measurement with a user-defined setting. The response of the control system is to adjust the pulse width modulation to bring the system ever closer to the required torque. This kind of closed loop control system is extremely common in DC motor drives and provides an efficient and low cost method of controlling torque. Just a small modification to this circuit will also allow us to regulate speed. Now, as an example of how this might work, let's say we have a target torque setting and the torque suddenly drops below this value. This will be instantaneously detected by the control loop and the output voltage on the armature will be modified in a way that minimizes the error and brings the system back to the required torque at a new steady state operating point. Now, so far I've discussed a scheme with a single switch, but we can also use so-called H-bridge schemes, which allow a reversible drive. So you can switch the transistors in a particular way to change the direction and of course control the speed and torque. So let's quickly summarize. We've talked about permanent magnet DC motors and they use permanent magnets to generate the magnetic field. We've observed that the speed regulation is very good because of the low armature volt drop. We've also seen that we can control the speed or torque by varying the armature voltage. And this is most efficiently done using electronic switches. We had a quick look at some control schemes which monitor the armature current, compare it with a setting, and then modify the voltage to try to hold the current at the required setting. Now, one thing about PMDC motors is the torque is limited by the field. We can't change the field, but they are cheaper than wound DC motors. And wound DC motors is where we go to next. And the first one we look at is called the separately excited DC motor. In many ways, this is very similar to the permanent magnet DC motor with the notable difference that we can now vary the field strength by varying the field current. What new possibilities does this open up? Well, let's take a look. The separately excited DC motor has two independent circuits, one for the armature and one for the field. 
Now, most of what we said in armature voltage control still stands for the separately excited DC motor. In fact, if we hold the field steady, the motors behave in a practically identical way. But one important difference is that we now have the ability to change the field as we wish. So the best place to start is to look at the effect of field strength on the performance of the motor. The relationship between field strength and speed is not intuitive. The speed actually decreases as the field strength goes up. But why is this the case? Well, we already know a few things about the dynamic behavior of the DC motor. And we already know about this voltage balance equation, which includes the voltage drop across the armature and the back EMF. Let's look at a simulation of the behavior of the separately excited DC motor with field weakening. Now, first off, if we employ armature voltage control, we can increase the speed and torque up to the rated values of the motor. But when we reach rated armature voltage and rated current, there's still a trick we can use to further increase the speed of the motor. Let's see what happens when we decrease the magnetic field. This is a process known as flux weakening. Now let's assume that the armature current is kept steady at its rated value by a control loop. We see that the torque decreases. This is because the motor is less good at producing torque from flux in a lower field. We also see that the back EMF must stay the same. This is because the supply is constant and the armature voltage drop is also constant because IA is constant. So back EMF, at least in the new steady state, is kept the same. This means the motor will have to spin faster to maintain the same back EMF in a lower field. So we reach a new steady state in which the electrical power is equal to the mechanical power, but with flux weakening, we're increasing in the speed whilst simultaneously reducing the torque. This is useful in some cases where we want our motor to exceed its base speed and we don't really mind about losing torque. So flux weakening has had a couple of major effects. First, we assume that armature current is steady because it's maxed out. And in this case, the torque will decrease with the field strength. Second, we also note that the back EMF stays approximately constant and the motor needs to speed up to ensure this is the case. So the speed increases with decreasing field strength. We've managed to find a way to trade off torque for speed above the base speed of the motor. And this is incredibly useful in some applications. And normally the strategy is to go with armature voltage control to maintain a constant torque, in which case there's no compromise. Once you get to the rated values of the motor, you can exceed base speed by using flux weakening, knowing that the torque will drop, but the actual power is constant because speed is increasing to compensate. To summarize, the separately excited DC motor has two independent circuits. Crucially, being able to weaken the field gives us the ability to go to speeds beyond what's possible in permanent magnet DC motors. This makes it good in applications requiring a wide speed range and also good control of torque. One of the disadvantages of the separately excited DC motor is the requirement for two independent sources. Interestingly, the shunt DC motor requires only a single source, so it has the field winding and the armature in parallel. Now, just like the other DC motors we've seen so far, the shunt motor has excellent speed regulation over a wide range of torque. In fact, it has a special reputation for speed regulation, but in reality, its principle of operation is the same as the other DC motors we've already encountered. And it's good regulation follows from the arguments we've already put forward. And in fact, the separately excited DC motor can do anything a shunt motor can do with the appropriate variation of armature voltage. Historically though, DC motors were constrained to a single fixed source. And under these conditions, the shunt motor had a strong performance. An interesting question to ask is what happens if the supply voltage changes? Interestingly, the answer is that not an awful lot happens. The speed is relatively unchanged. Now let's say we halve the supply voltage. The field of course will be halved and the armature supply voltage will also be halved. We know already that the speed is proportionate to armature supply voltage, so halving it will halve the speed. But we also know the speed is proportionate to field, and if you halve the field, the motor will have to spin twice as fast to maintain the back EMF required to satisfy the voltage balance equation. The net effect is the speed isn't really affected very much. 
So shunt DC motors tend to be used when you require good speed regulation over a wide range of torque. So things like conveyor belts. Series DC motors have the field winding and the armature in series. And this leads to some very interesting and noteworthy behavior. The special feature of the series DC motor is it's very high starting torque, but poor regulation. Now this high starting torque is very useful in some industrial applications, but if you increase the speed, the torque diminishes very quickly. This is very different to the other motors we've seen so far. Why is this the case? While at startup, the armature current is extremely high and the back EMF is extremely low because the motor is going at a slow speed. Now, because the armature current and the field current are the same, a high current means high field. And so the torque is huge. However, as the motor speeds up, the back EMF must increase. As it increases, the current must get smaller. Now, if you think about it, the torque is proportionate to the square of the current. So it's very sensitive to changes in current. So the fact that we have IF is equal to IA makes it inescapable that torque is huge at low speed and small at high speed. In fact, there's not much room in the middle with the series motor. We can have either high torque and high field or low torque and low field. There's not really that much room in the middle because the current transitions very quickly. So let's review the series motor. The field and armature currents are in series, so they must be the same at all times. At startup, the speed is low, so back EMF is low. Remember, back EMF usually limits the current, so the current starts high. Since torque is proportionate to the square of current, torque starts off big. But as the motor speeds up, the current must get smaller and the torque drops away very, very quickly, leading to poor regulation. Well done if you've made it this far, we've covered a lot of topics in this video and I just wanted to end with a few important points. Firstly, I would suggest you always return to the basic mental model for the operation of the DC motor using the Lorentz force. This is so fundamental and it's difficult to make sense of much else unless you have a good intuition of this. Second, I just wanted to emphasize the importance of variable DC supplies, and in particular, the emergence of electronic switches, e.g. transistor-based control schemes. These have made it possible for more sophisticated DC motor control schemes, and with the separately excited motor, it's worth realizing that we have the flexibility to do anything the shunt or series motor can do with the appropriate voltage control of the armature and field. Next, I'll move on to AC motors, so stay tuned for that um, and content like this but I think I'll leave it at this I hope you enjoyed the video thanks for watching